Uh, so thank you all again for joining us from desktop to the cloud. Um, this will be a panel with Evalara, Mendelssohn Consulting, and Sin7. So we'll dive right in. I want to first introduce you to your three panelists today. We have Carl Kaiser, Christy Booker, and Keith Valesia. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let each of you kind of take a few minutes to introduce yourselves and explain more about your company. So Carl, we'll start with you. Hello and thank you. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Can I get a, can I get a thumbs up? All right, perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Carl Kaiser. I joined Sin7 um, last year as the channel partnerships manager. So I work in the Intuit ecosystem with all our wonderful partners here. Um, and I'll let Christy take it away. Yeah. Hey, guys. I'm Christy Booker. I've been at Avalara now for about four years. I manage our partnership and sales with Sin7 here at Avalara and very happy to be here. Hi there, I'm Keith Felicia. I'm with Mendelssohn Consulting. We are a QuickBooks consulting firm. So when these partner managers talk to people, they actually talk to us. I'm the chief operating officer. Uh, we are primarily focused on a QuickBooks centric solution, uh, but taking people to the next level with it. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Great, thank you all so much. Um, if you wanna talk a little bit more um, about what you do or, or what your company does as we move forward, that's great. But we'll go ahead and dig right in. So let's start with our first question. Um, what is the cloud and how is it different from desktop? Yeah, I'll go oh. first on this one. Um, sorry, Carl. No, you got <laughs> um, it, I just you can probably expand more after me. I just have kind of like textbook definitions of what is the cloud, how is it different than the desktop. So the cloud is basically a distributed collection of servers that host software and infrastructure is accessed via the internet. Um, it's different from desktop because desktop systems are actually installed on a company's hardware. Some systems may require IT expertise to install and manage it. Um, and cloud-based software runs on a supplier servers in the cloud and business users access it over the internet. Great. So, so for me, for me, the, yeah, the, for me, the, the, the big difference is um, any, anytime, anywhere access. So in reality, it's supposed to having your IT guy walk in to install a new hard drive or new memory in a physical piece of equipment in your office. Um, this is uh, hosted uh, on the, on the internet by somebody else and available from wherever you are. If you're you know sitting on the beach, um, you can actually access a cloud-based system uh, much easier than you can access your internal. So so it's a, a very effective, and uh, we all learned since 2020 that we needed to be agile and uh, much quicker at getting to our systems. Yeah, and. Appreciate the those definitions, right? And um, oh, Carl, I think we might have lost you for a second there. Hey, sorry. Can you still hear me? There we go. Yep. Yeah, my apologies. I just had a, a technical issue um, here. I was getting a phone call. So my apologies. <laughs> but yeah, no, I really appreciate the, those two definitions. And I'm really excited to have you on today, Keith, especially, right? Because when modernizing your strategy and migrating to the cloud, it's, it's not just about getting there, but it's also what you do when you get there. And there's so many questions to be answered along the way. And businesses of all sizes really require the assistance. And I think Mendelssohn, has a very unique position in this space. So really excited to, to continue this conversation about your experience with this particular topic. Yeah. Great. We're gonna move over to question number two. Um, what would you say are the biggest benefits of migrating to cloud-based solutions? Pete, you wanna take this one? Um, sure, absolutely. So, so first off, it 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 makes it makes it available for people to work remotely. Uh, you know, since the pandemic, uh, we've all experienced a lack of available talent in our in our neighborhood. People stopped going into the office. We had to get distributed, and we had to do it very very quickly with the start of COVID. Um, 
And it changed kind of uh, the mindset that we can do things from many places and get the same thing. So as a company, Mendelssohn, we employ people all over the country, uh, as far away as uh, we actually have an employee out just outside of Paris in France. Uh, they have access to our systems. I don't have to worry about backing stuff up when I go on site with the client because it's all readily available. It's it's right there. Um, huge benefit from hiring, uh, data accessibility. Um, I can be on the crappy Wi-Fi that you get on Southwest Airlines um, and still be able to access my systems and, and work on a flight. So it's just, to me, it's it's amazing. Yeah, for sure. And I think too, like just contextualizing this conversation um, in, in terms of like the clients that we deal with, right? Because I think when we're talking about the small and medium sized businesses that we work with on a daily basis, they are still using a lot of on-premise systems, right? Or downloaded systems. And I think that sometimes the idea of switching over to like a cloud base or some kind of hybrid situation is, is somewhat complex, right? And so like using that as, as kind of the baseline here and just saying like, okay, what is this, what does it take to, to kind of make this next step or even start to think about this, right? And we know that the benefits are there. There's there's a lot, right? Anything from increased agility and flexibility, the ability to innovate faster, the easing of resource demands, right? And just better managing um, customer expectations through the cloud because we're able to log on anywhere, anytime. Yep. Just to piggyback off that too, Carl, which at, at Avalara, we are a cloud-based solution. So I'm a little bit biased obviously here, but we have a cloud-based um, sales tax automation solution. So that's just what we do. But um, in agreement with Carl and Keith, um, we also, you know, have a lot of remote employees. It's super important for everyone to be able to access their work these days from all, all around the world. Um, we also have global employees, and I would just say it's it allows your business to expand and grow um, and scale as you throughout the years as you get bigger and maybe sell through different channels. You know, many businesses are not just selling in their one home state through a brick and mortar store. Now people are expanding to e-commerce, um, you know, selling all, all over, even internationally. So it's super important to keep that competitive edge in a business's industry. And like Carl said, it can definitely improve customer satisfaction and their overall experience. Thanks, everybody. Great answers across the board. Thanks so much. We'll move on to the next question. And just as a reminder, if you are submitting questions, we'll get to all of them at the end. Plenty of times for questions. So please don't hesitate to add any questions into the Q&A. All right, question three. With the migration of legacy desktop users to cloud infrastructure, what are some common hiccups or roadblocks that you see? Uh, how does having a cloud-based IMS and tax compliance software ease those challenges? So this is, this is a great question. This is near and dear to my heart. So at Mendelssohn, one of the things that we do is we make sure we're providing the right solution to the right client at the right time. So there are different ways that you can get to the cloud. So you can look for a solution that is already cloud-based, and we've all seen it in the QuickBooks infrastructure, which is QuickBooks Online. Um, there's a big push uh, across that, across the entire input organization to drive people to that. But Sally has a question is, hey, I, I pay for one desktop version of QuickBooks, but I would like to use that online. So that's the second where you can get a hosted solution um, and that can be, I, I like to think of it as a virtual server. Uh, so it's a server dedicated to you. You can get there, you can still be on the cloud, but you're using your legacy applications. Um, so, so the challenges are, what, do you, what access do you need? What software do you need there? Um, can you get that software somewhere else? And I know what Sally's saying. I, I, I can have 50 clients in QuickBooks Desktop, but Input wants me to have 50 subscriptions of QuickBooks Online completely understand that and that can be cost prohibitive. So so financially you have to make make sure it's the right decision. And is the feature set there um, in the cloud offering? So when you're looking at different solutions, you know, there's a number of factors that go into it. So that's the roadblock. It could be a financial roadblock um, or a feature roadblock, depending on what you need. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Keith. And, and Sally, I hope that kind of brings up some of your answers that you were looking for. Uh, Christy or Carl, do either of you have anything you want to add before we move on? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Christy has pl uh, plenty to say about tax compliance in terms of IMS there for those who don't know, um, inventory management system. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot to dive into when it comes to tax compliance, IMS and things like that. I think if we're taking a, a high level view here, right, the way that I see you know, having cloud solutions on the back end for complex processes is you're driving down the highway with a with towing three trailers behind you. You can't really see anything. You don't know what's going on back there. You have to pull over and go and check those things individually to make sure nothing's wrong versus just driving down the highway, looking down the highway through a single pane of glass, right? So I think that those are important considerations to make, right? Where when you're moving, especially into like something like Sin7, um, something like a, a cloud IMS or an ERP, we really help businesses like manage less, sell more, and see everything across the whole inventory ecosystem just because we have that single point of, of contact being the cloud, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just to weigh in on this as well, of course, um, with the tax compliance piece, just sales tax compliance is so complex for businesses these days, it's nearly impossible to um, do things manually or even keep it on a desktop. I mean, we've had instances and in, in my experience at Avalara where one person has all the sales tax information and knowledge and everything on their desktop and they leave or, you know, their account or whatever gets uh, disabled. And then like there goes all of the sales tax uh, resources at the company. That's when a lot of people come to Avalara for automation and to switch over to the cloud to kind of ease challenges like those um, and making a transition over to an automated solution. Yeah, yeah totally. I, 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 so I have two things. First off, I wanna make sure everyone's aware that there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen because I know that Sally was asking questions, but anyone can ask questions at any time through this. Um, so at the bottom of your go to meeting or sorry, Zoom screen, you can do that. Um, uh, but, you know, I, again, I, I keep going back. We, you know, we, we were interviewed for a couple of blogs through the pandemic about the effects of the pandemic on business. So it's super near and dear to my heart. One of the things that happened for, uh, for a lot of small businesses, they had, there had to be a pivoting, you know, kind of like Ross, Ross Geller in, in uh, moving a, uh, in friends, you know, pivot, 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 where we had to start selling in other areas you know, retail stores were shut down. We had to come up with this and, and, and pivot our business in order to be successful. I had clients that made dermatological substance uh, and they, they pivoted to hand sanitizer. So a lot of changes, but we, uh, we all went online. And when we went online, uh, the, the tax became much more complex. So that's where now we have to look at, you know, as a profitable business, it came very, very profitable for a lot of people. But we have to manage that. And are we spending more time administrating our businesses or managing them? And that's where cloud comes in with the right solution. Yeah, I, I love that example, Keith. That is like number, that's the number one thing, right? And where this really came into the fold, like was the pandemic, but all of a sudden businesses realized like, hey, we're we're wholly inefficient here. Like there's a lot of efficiencies and and things that we're we're missing out on, and that's simply because like we don't have a unified system. My uh, my son worked for a company that is a trading card company, and they do uh, they're one of the the they're Magic Gathering. Don't don't ask me to explain it. My son is big into it. He's made the pro tour. He's been he travels with it extensively. He apparently apparently is really good at it. And there's a card coming out that bounty on it is $2 million for a single card. Uh, but the owner of his business kept everyone employed. He didn't shut down a retail store and they made money by people walking into the store buying products. They made money by running tournaments. And that was completely shut down. He did not lay off a single person. They cleaned the store, they re re restocked shelves, but they focused on their online business. And as a result of that, um, everyone was gainfully employed through the whole whole time of the pandemic. Not a single person was was left off. They changed the hours. They became the dominant player online online in this space. End of the pandemic, he's got he his profits were high enough to buy his own building and renovate it. Like it just 
pivoting for his business was brilliant. And I gave the guy, the, the owner, a lot of credit because he could have laid everyone off and he didn't. And and the success story was huge. Um, so online is here to stay. Uh, this internet thing is 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 going to be around for a couple more years, I think. Yeah, it sounds about right, Keith. I think it's safe to say. Mm -hmm. All right, question four. This is a two-parter. Uh, can you all tell us what are the biggest challenges your clients face as they transition their technologies to the cloud? And then how do they justify when your clients make that decision to make that switch, knowing those challenges? Look, it's new. Anything new is always going to be a challenge. You have to have, you know, adopters of it. Um, they have to understand how they're accessing it. And as, if you're changing applications, particularly when we do implementations, um, we always have to have the ROI, the reason to believe. Why are we changing from QuickBooks Desktop 2019? You know, what am I going to gain? Where's the ROI? And then you have to train people. And as we go through um, an implementation, there's always going to be somebody at the water cooler saying, I don't know why we're doing this. Everything was working fine. You know, this is just stupid. We're just wasting money on this thing. Um, so when we do a, a hands-on implementation with somebody, we're, we're reinforcing why we made the decision. It's not an overnight thing. No one's clicking a magic button. Um, now I'm on a magic theme apparently today. Um, no one's clicking a magic button to transform your business into a new solution. It has to be set up. It has to be trained. And we have to have the workflows and processes around it. So that is the challenge. Um, you know, people had to move quickly during the pandemic. Uh, we saw in our business a little downturn initially. And then we saw people reinvesting in their infrastructure to support the future, uh, which brought us actually above. Uh, so for us, uh, things worked out really, really well. But, you know, you, you got to you got to be committed to it. You have to know why you're making the change. And uh, there has to be an ROI against it. Yeah, Keith, I would love to kind of pick your brain, too. And just for the value uh, to the audience members here. Right. People need to ask themselves, what is the business value being gained by moving to the cloud? Right. Because a move is far more than just an exercise. It needs to be rooted in actual business outcomes. So specific objectives the company wants to achieve, right? What are some things that Mendelssohn uses in terms of metrics, KPIs, ROI justifications, and things like that to, to help those clients through that journey? So what we do is we actually, when we're, when we're getting involved with a project like this, the first thing we do is a needs assessment. Um, we we live in this space. We we do this every day. So I know what our software is out there, what capabilities, what features, what do you need? Uh, so we'll actually come in and it, it's for a fee service and we'll evaluate your business. We'll ask you the questions for the things you never thought of. Um, and where do you want to be in the future? And make sure when we're putting together a, a recommendation, it's based upon your needs. You know, I did one this morning. We look at the inventory flows. What type of inventory do you have? Where do you get it from? How are you doing it today? Um, uh, the client I was working with actually is using uh, SBT software, formerly known as ACPAC. And for anyone that is old like me, that'll actually ring through. Um, Christy, Carl, I uh, have no idea what <laughs> I'm talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, early, early on, you know, back in the 80s, um, ACPAC was the dominant player. So it, it's really about delivering a solution that's going to have an ROI. Um, if I don't have an ROI against this, don't, don't make the change. And you'll always get resistance from people. I have one client that's making a change, but they want the system that we're putting in to do exactly what their old system did. Like, I mean, far none, like everything. They want to be identical. And I said, why are you changing? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then maybe Christy, you can touch on that piece, like managing risk is a key component of businesses, right? And like moving to the cloud, people are worried about risk. Can you talk about like that tax compliance component of the risk of compliance versus non-compliance? I think that's a really interesting point to make here too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just, you know, with the question as far as like the biggest challenges your clients could face as they transition, at Avalara, we always say our biggest competitor is just people doing things the way they've always done them. And it's just like Keith said, is it's not, it's not really like 
making the switch is just change is very hard for anyone in any industry or business. And it's just getting out of your own head. And of course, there's a big learning curve um, with any type of new software or system or moving things to the cloud. Um, there's adjustments and, and a lot of learning going on to do. Um, and then, yeah, so as far as compliance goes with risk, I mean, we we obviously think the cloud is where it's at, where you're not gonna have, like you're gonna have the most secure solution, your risk is gonna be minimized because you're not letting your sales tax compliance be prone to human error, which is um, one of the, the biggest things in the way as far as, you know, people doing sales tax, it's not manageable, it's not possible for someone to get everything absolutely right. And so that minimizes your risk by having a centralized solution like Avalara that you know is completely accurate. We keep up with everything in real time. There's just no worry and you're not spending time worrying about it, doing it. You can focus all of your energy and efforts and even your time and resources within the company on revenue generating activities and getting, you know, driving profit instead of worrying about things like sales tax compliance. And that's where we come in and where the cloud is a huge benefit. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. And I'm I'm just a huge fan of Avalara personally too. I just think it's <laughs> it's so cool. It's like one of those things where it's just like, wow, this is such a pain. So like having a tool that just does it all for you is amazing. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Sales tax is no one's favorite thing to do, or even no one wants to talk about it. So except for us. <laughs> yeah, and of course, any anything that involves the government, if you if I make a mistake, they're always so reasonable. Oh, that's OK. We'll just <laughs> forgive you this time. Right. Um, no, when you make a mistake, uh, they they're all over you. And yep. and there, there are things about Avalara that people don't realize, again, with this pivoting, uh, I like to use shipping as an example. So if you're selling online now and you're, you have a shipping charge, well, the state of California likes to tax everything. So there's a tax on that shipping charge. But in Arizona, there's no tax. So Avalara allows, uh, will know what item it is and they'll tax it appropriately to the jurisdiction. Uh, it's just a huge thing that people don't seem to realize when it comes to sales tax. They just charge no tax. And and there we, we've seen reports of states coming after larger resellers out that are out of state. I could yeah. do a whole webinar on this. Yeah, it absolutely does happen, and that's another big thing with risk. I mean, audit um, audit protection that's a huge uh, risk that people take as far as with sales tax compliance, and the cloud kind of protects them against um, in an audit like a solution as far as Avalara. Hmm. This was a really great question. I think we've really identified things that people might be concerned about. The biggest I hear being change, but so many other subsects that people don't really think about until they're knee deep in it. So I think you've really highlighted why this is such an important transition. Um, we'll move into our next question. You know, never knowing everything you all know about small businesses, um, what are the top three things that you think you would suggest to them to succeed in some some tumultuous times that we're kind of in right now. And on the flip side of that, um, what are things that they could be doing that might cause failure? This is such a such a loaded questions. Um, so first and foremost, you as a business, we we can no longer rely on our local market. Um, you know, there are some types of businesses that that you can um, absolutely, you know, require service. So I'm currently looking for a hot water tank. I'm not going to hire somebody from Florida to drive here and install a hot water tank. But the distributor of the hot water tank, that's a different story. Um, trying to pick pick one. I don't know why there's 8,000 different hot water tanks per manufacturer and what they all do, but but it, it's it's about being a, being available in the space where, where it's needed. And that space could be your local community if you're a service-based business. Uh, for us, we're a service-based business, but you know, I'm on planes, trains, and automobiles all the time to help people implement solutions. So what is your market and how can you expand that? Uh, that's the first thing that we need to address. Can I get more business by adding on another state or a web store or a, a more robust shopping cart or becoming part of Amazon FBA if I'm an inventory-based businesses? Um, talent. Finding and acquiring talent has been a huge challenge. I don't know where everyone went. Um, so the pandemic hit, 
and all of a sudden getting people for, for small business was, uh, uh, was huge. Uh, so, um, so how, how do you acquire the right talent? So we as a business have been distributed for, for decades, um, medicine consulting, um, that was primarily because I refused to move to Florida from Tucson, but, uh, no. So I've worked remotely this whole time, but getting, not only getting the talent that can work remote. So you have bigger, deeper talent pool is essential, but finding the right people to work remote, not everyone can sit in front of their computer eight hours a day and not be distracted by what's on TV or what's going on in the family or going grocery shopping in the middle of the day. So you have to get and acquire the right talent with the right skill set, mindset, and, and capabilities. So those are going to be two of the things that are going to drive business. Um, doing what we always did, um, I think going forward is is a recipe for failure because business changes at the speed of business. Um, if you don't change, you know, at some point you're going to be, uh, not around. Uh, I, years ago, I worked for a music, um, automation company. Well, we actually made radio stations. Uh, we had software that would put music on hard drive and instead of, you know, pulling a CD and, and sticking it in there, we would do that. And that was at the height of Napster. So their whole battle with the record labels and Napster was going on. And uh, I was at a conference and I, I was talking to a couple of, of record execs and they at that point were making Napster spell Madonna 53 different ways so people couldn't download it. Um, and I said to them, I said, you know, this is just so stupid because in music, in audio quality, a CD quality song is there's a sampling, there's there's a technical piece to it, sampling a bit rate to get quality. AM radio is 15,000 cycles per second. Uh, CD is 44,100. So I said, why don't you limit the sample rate and the bit rate? So you, so everyone can share that Madonna song, but it's going to sound like crap. And then have a premium service that if you want to get good quality stuff, they pay for the for access to that. And these radio record execs that I was talking to said, we will never turn our backs on our friends at, 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 at places like Sam Goody's. And again, showing my age, Sam Goodies is where you would go to buy music. Um, and they they literally said that to me. And I just went, wow, this is just so weird. Well, look at where we are today. Um, you want a song? I, I've got um, Apple Music. I have every song in the world on my phone that I could possibly want. Um, funny enough, I now do have an actual vinyl record player in my house again. Um, so... So it, but business, the thing about business is it's going to change and, you know, um, you have to be there or be left behind. Yeah, absolutely. No changes, changes certain, right. Among all the uncertainties of life, that's, that's certain. Um, and, you know, I would probably also add, right. Like in the, one of the top three things to succeed, maybe we can add a fourth here too, is like, if your business is not online essentially in in any capacity and you know we work with a lot of clients who don't need to be online they're a manufacturer they wholesale business, business to business that's totally fine but if if you're a, a a company that can expand through online channels look there's five billion people using the internet that is a total addressable market that's massive it's never been available to anyone at any point in history right so i think we have this huge opportunity above us and or sorry in front of us um to open up channels into those new spaces, right? And I think that this opportunity is unprecedented for businesses to really be able to expand into those those new spaces and you know really be effective at selling in those spaces as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I just agree, obviously, with uh, Keith and Carl that just you know to fail as a business, it would you know my two cents would be to not keep up with changing times and technologies. It's just to do what you've always done. And you get in your own way doing that. Um, and, you know, we like to compare, at Avalara, we like to compare the cloud um, to an iPhone and then, you know, keeping things the same or on a desktop to like a flip phone. Like you're just going to lose out. Like there's going to be stuff that you can't do that you can do with on the cloud or with an automated solution. Um, so I completely agree that um, just not keeping up with changing technologies and times, uh, there's going to be something missed um, in the gap there. 
Well, even things like, you know, I'm looking for my hot water tank. And when I'm looking for a company to do it, I, you know, I, so I, I've been researching hot water tanks. I, I'm not going to become an expert. I refuse to, but I'll go to a site and I'll say, who, who's your resellers? And I'll go try to find their website. And if they don't have a website, they, they, they're off my list. They yep. might be the best plumber in the country. Um, they might have the cheapest prices. I'm just not going to go with them. So even that little piece of your business, having a presence on the internet, you know, I've often will just Google stuff. My kids type at 60 words a minute with their thumbs mm-hmm. um, and they do it on their phones. But uh, yeah, it's, it's so critical to, to keep up with the times. Yeah. yeah great. Oh, sorry. Chris, yeah. Oh no, you're fine. I was just going to say to kind of uh, mirror what Carl said about channels to sell through. I mean, there's so many business opportunities out there. Selling through marketplaces is another big one. You know, Amazon, all the different marketplaces and different drop shipping channels that are out there that you can get um, access to more customers and just expand and grow. So I just wanted to add that little piece in there. Yeah, great points, everybody. Um, I really think, you know, you've highlighted what we need to focus on here is just as everyone said, keeping up with the times, making sure you're not falling behind, um, especially with with so much opportunity with something like the cloud. Um, I know we're getting a little close on time. I want to make sure that everyone's questions are answered. So uh, we'll kind of go quickly through these next couple questions. Um, This next one, I think we can kind of, we've all kind of touched base on this a little bit. So briefly, if you guys can explain, how do you support QuickBooks desktop um, versus Office and, and what does that look like for you? Um, I think, so we could, we could dive into this probably ad nauseum, right? I, everyone on this call is really familiar with QuickBooks desktop and QuickBooks online. I, I think that we can probably maybe forward through this question, unless anyone in the audience like really wants to, to dive into it, but essentially supporting desktop users versus online users. I think it comes more down to like the business case for, um, Sorry, the business case for, you know, is your, do you want your systems to be connected or disparate, right? And when you're on the desktop, it's kind of the same theme that we've been touching on this entire time, right? Do you want your processes to be essentially siloed to to one spot? I mean, you can also change that to Keith's point, you can get QuickBooks desktop hosted, right? But that's still a migration. That's still a cloud strategy in, in and of itself. Thanks, Carl. And thanks for correcting me. I said it so fast. Didn't think twice about it. It's QuickBooks Online. Thanks, everybody. Uh, We'll go ahead to the next one. Um, I think this is one of our last questions. Can you guys just go into how secure the cloud is um, versus keeping things, you know, with yourselves on premises? Absolutely. So I'm sure everyone on this call has received an email that I got one today for one of my, my, my employees that said, hey, I need to quickly change my direct deposit account for my, um, for, for my paycheck before the payroll next week. The email had nothing to do with her, didn't come from her. Uh, I also got an email from somebody, and these guys are getting super creative. It, it was sent to, to one of my team members, and it said, what is this charge for? And it had a PDF document. So in a traditional on-prem type of uh, system, where all of your data is stored on a single drive, clicking on that uh, will expose you to ransomware. You know, we're we're past viruses. We are now into ransomware, and 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 we all know somebody that's been impacted by that. So there are security protocols that need to be in in place. So in a cloud system, you know, and I'll just for example, QuickBooks Online or Sin Seven. Double clicking on that icon isn't going to access your ERP, your, your your system, because that's a separate cloud base. So it's not not stored on the same computer. So that's a huge security place. Now you can get what I call the virtual server. Absolutely. And put there are things that are put in place that will stop people from opening those things. But security, it's, it's absolutely essential that the way that people are trying to get into your computers, you know, heck, I, I get those phone calls, that, you know, I you know, hi, this, I'm calling from, from Windows support and I need access to your computer because we noticed a virus, you know, and people let them in, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, and then some of the new ones, they're not even trying, they're, they're spelling things wrong. They're just hoping you're going to click on stuff. 
Uh, so from a security perspective, uh, it's not their data on a drive. From a, um, uh, from a, uh, from a backup perspective, you know, we, we have clients, you have to have a backup strategy. We actually teach for desktop an entire course on maintaining and, and backing up your QuickBooks file. And one slide, we have the word backup 50 times, but it's not on a desktop on-prem environment. It's not just backing up. Backing up the data, make sure it's available near long. It's making sure you have a copy of that data offsite in case something happens to the building um, that wipes it out where all of that is. So people have to think about all of that stuff uh, and people don't. Uh, we had a client where we were doing, back when we had an IT division, uh, we had a client that we were adding a hard drive and we won't touch a server unless somebody has backed it up and their backup wasn't working, they found out. So we said, well, we're not coming in, we're canceling the appointment, You know, we'll put in a new backup. No, we have a guy. So they finally put in a new backup, do the whole thing. We do the work on, on the weekend. Wednesday of that week, the owner's wife clicked on an email and ransomware went through the entire system. Um, because we had forced them to put a backup in place, they were able to recover it. If they hadn't, they would have had to go buy Bitcoin and pay somebody for the release key, leaving that software still on their server. So, you know, huge, huge things like that are just absolutely essential. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, Keith. And I mean, people talk about AI. And I, I'm sorry, we almost got through a whole webinar without saying it. But um, people are talking a lot about that these days. And, you know, ransomware and security risk are just going to increase exponentially with the use of these new technologies, right? And I think that we're going to start seeing rather than very large enterprises be targeted, we're also going to see smaller enterprises be targeted, it's going to be automated, it's going to be um, you know, part of what we've seen kind of up market where humans have been engaging in this activity. Now we're going to see a lot more like machine driven activity in this space too. So like to your point, very important that their applications are secured or as secure as possible in an environment where, you know, everyone's going to be at risk here. Absolutely. Yeah, you guys have made a lot of really good points. And I think you know, everyone wants to be really cautious of their data and, and making sure that they're safe and secure. Um, but but you really identified the purpose of the backups and, and making sure that you have everything accessible to you whenever you need it, right? So, so you highlight a lot of good things. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in. I, again, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move to those. Um, just real quick, is there anything else we want to add before we go into the general Q&A? Great. Okay. Well, then um, I think this, these couple questions are going to go to Carl, and then we've got one um, to discuss the manual lift and moving to the cloud. So, Carl, real quick, two questions for you. Is SIN 7 compatible with QuickBooks 2023? And is SIN 7 forcing a switch over to cloud-based usage with QuickBooks? Yeah, so I see three questions here. So I'm going to try to get three birds with one stone. So there's a question, is SIN 7 compatible with QuickBooks Desktop? Um, is SIN 7 forcing a switch based on usage with QuickBooks? Um, and then another Desktop 23 question. So the answer is that SIN 7 is not compatible directly with QuickBooks Desktop, but we connect with plenty of QuickBooks Desktop clients. How do we do that? We work with somebody like Mendelssohn, who creates essentially a connector at, through an API, which can just transfer that data through. Um, we just don't support that integration directly anymore. Um, and the reason for that is, is Intuit and QuickBooks has essentially been sunsetting previous versions of desktop. So for us to support the, the, the tool properly, we would have to keep changing our product every time that Intuit wants to release a new version of their tool. So our workaround around that now is just working through an API. So we do and we don't is the short answer, but technically we can definitely do that. Um, and then is since I've been forcing a switch to cloud-based usage, um, I hope that that answered your question, but please throw in a follow-up if I didn't answer it. Great. So, um, so, so a couple of things, actually, I want, I want to, you know, talk about a couple of things. So there's this question about moving to the cloud. Again, it's going to be different and it's about the right solution. We have tons of clients that remain on desktop uh, today. We service them as well, depending on their capabilities. 
And, you know, Carl's going to, you know, send me hate mail after this conference. But sometimes a customer can do what they need with QuickBooks Desktop um, and doesn't don't need to move to something like Sin7 at that moment, uh, you know, as you grow. I, I want everyone to be really clear. So QuickBooks is what I call um, the circle of QuickBooks life is this. You start with QuickBooks, whether it's online or desktop, because the IRS and your accountant says you have to track stuff. And as you grow, you start, your business evolves and you start utilizing that data to make actual business decisions. You know, what were my sales last year, run rates, whatever, whatever decision, but it becomes an important piece. And then as you continue to grow. Now, traditionally, what people have said is they're going to hit the end, end of this and they're going to go, oh, now, you know, I've outgrown QuickBooks. So I need to move to NetSuite. I need to move to, you know, or I need to move to, and now I'm naming a bunch of competitors, which I probably shouldn't be doing, but you don't have to go to that expense. Those implementations, you know, what's the manual lift? Those implementations start at six figures just for the services to get there and will take six to 12 months minimum. Um, Something like Sin7 allows you to stay in QuickBooks at a fraction of the cost, and the implementation is, is less than that. So we have clients at Mendelssohn that, are, that started with desktop, um, we're using the features, outgrew desktop, and we've gone to add-ons that, that allow them to not have to spend a quarter of a million dollars on a new solution. Um, and we have other clients that, that, um, that you know, QuickBooks want, want to be completely online. So QuickBooks Online with Sin7, fantastic solution because uh, why have part of it in one space and the other part on the cloud you know that almost you know doesn't make sense to me uh, so then it just becomes a functions and features piece and remember once you move to something like sin7 um, that's your operational software everything else quickbooks just becomes what it does really well accounting you know pnls balance sheets you know account payables you're receiving funny money your inventory or whatever your service is all continues to run through Sin7 and QuickBooks barely even knows that it's there. Yeah. And sorry. To, ex to expand on that. Oh, sorry. Did I cut you off there, Keith? No, 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 no. No. I, yeah. I just wanted to expand too on like the manual lift of moving to the cloud. Moving to the cloud isn't just like, hey, I'm going to pack up my, my bags on desktop and then move them over to the cloud. What really, it's it's more of a mindset, right? So it's, it's a shift in the way we think and the way we do business. And we eventually want to create an entirely new technology operating model and culture that enables the company to innovate more quickly, efficiently, and effectively, right? That's the ultimate goal here. Thanks, Carl. We've got one more question. Um, and I'm just going to put this slide up in case you want to access any of these sites, um, Mendelssohn Consulting, www.mendelssohnconsulting.com, uh, avalara.com, sin7.com. Please feel free to visit. We'll also be sending you some follow-up. So um, if you have more questions or you think of them later, you'll have access to some really great uh, experts in the field. Um, but the last question we'll leave it on um, and I'm not sure if any of you can see it. How can we create limitations on third-party partners accessing our data through the cloud? It looks like Kate is experiencing um, some difficulties with Amazon directly manipulating their inventory. Um, and, and can any of you speak to that? Or we so, can follow up with Kate after this call yeah, as well if we yeah. want to get the best answer. No, we can. Okay, we can so answer. actually, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna throw something out there on this. Um, so Amazon is what I call the 800 pound gorilla. They're out there, you know, in this business model. You have to use FBA. You have to use um, some form of that. Um, so you have to do business with them, but because they're the 800 pound gorilla, they get to set the rules. And, you know, I have, I have a client that does a ton of business through FBA, and we have to do an inventory count at the end of the month. And that's because, you know, you get your inventory report and you say, okay, here's, here's how many units we have. And we want to find out how many Amazon lost or broke. So if I'm a customer of Amazon, I buy your stuff and I send it back to them and it's not usable, they trash it and charge you. So, so that's where you have to understand, you might not have had a sales transaction or refund, um, but they lost it. On the other side, they actually find stuff. 
it's the most bizarre thing. So we'll do a count. Okay, you know, here at the end of the month, Amazon said we had 1,100 units. We sold 300, and then we shipped another 200. Um, so I should have uh, I should have a thousand units at the end of the month, but I end up with a thousand fifty. And you go, well, how did they end up with a thousand fifty? That's because Amazon found a pallet somewhere that was in transit between warehouses. So it's very difficult to track Amazon stuff. Uh, the best thing to do is when we set this up is we generally will do an inventory adjustment at the end of the month and point it to an Amazon CODS account, Amazon Reconciliation, so we know if we're winning or losing on Amazon. My other personal favorite thing about Amazon is they say, ship us a thousand things, but if we don't sell it in 30 days, we're gonna charge you stored. Yeah, that's a good point, Keith. And then also I wanted to address the SIN7 portion of that question, um, which was how do we prevent the data being pushed back or forth, right? So there's a few options within within SIN7. So we can mat, we we can essentially turn off a couple settings. We match the product manually with Amazon. We can update the stock levels and we can use Amazon as a master to manipulate our inventory levels. So if there's a particular issue with uh, Amazon and your connector with SIN7, I would just go into the settings, take a look at how that data is being pushed over. Um, and then, yeah, if there's any if there's any questions or or concerns past that point, just get in touch with us. We'll be more than happy to figure that out for you. Great. Thank you, everybody, for for answering those questions. It looks like we have reached our time. We even went over just a skosh. So we will go ahead and give everyone the rest of the hour. But thank you all so much for attending. Um, really, thank you, Christy, Carl, Keith. You were spectacular. Um, if anyone needs anything or has more questions, um, please feel free to visit any of our websites. And we'll be following up with you um, with a recording of this webinar if you want to access it later um, or if you have any other questions on what this looks like or, or anything like that. So Thank you all again so much and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.